of the three beverages. The intoxicating part is always the same substance, ethyl alcohol. You need a drink to have fun. I do not. You ever take a drink in the morning to relieve a hangover? The more alcohol that reaches the liver at one time, the more alcohol goes on to the heart unchanged. Well, welcome to uh, the next episode of The Field Alcohologist. I'm here tonight at Gravity Heights uh, with Ryan Trim. How's it going, Ryan? Good, good. How are you? I'm good, man. Yeah? Um, Thanks for having us. Uh, I'd like to just kind of have a nice discussion about... uh, the brewery, some of your beers, the local scene in San Diego for craft brew, and and go from there. And uh, we can maybe start with a little bit of your background and then talk about what we're drinking here. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I guess I should start with kind of uh, my day job, which is how I met you, really, was um, I have a degree, a PhD in clinical psychology, and I've been here in San Diego since 2006. Um, I have appointments at uh, UC San Diego in the Department of Psychiatry, where I do mostly research. And I also have an appointment at the VA San Diego, where I uh, manager of a clinic there, outpatient clinic, um, help with supervision, training, direct clinical care. So that's my day job. Right. Um, this whole venture here is a whole side project. So um, Gravity Heights is a, a brew pub, brewery restaurant located in the heart of Serena Mesa, which is a suburb of San Diego. Um, we're kind of in the um, tech corridor here of San Diego, where Qualcomm is one of the biggest employers. Their main headquarters is basically a block away from here. So we have a lot of uh, uh, sort of clientele that are in that sort of area. that are close by, a lot of uh, customers and guests within half mile here that can walk here, very short drive. So, so we founded this, we're, all, we're less than a year old. We, we opened the doors to the public in uh, this past January and um, so we're about, what is that, 10 months in. Um, and it's a project I developed with some friends. So uh, my partners on this are Arturo Cassell, who's the CEO of Wiscomalino Hospitality, which is a restaurant group here in San Diego. And Skip Virgilio, who was the original brewmaster and one of the co-founders of Alesmith Brewing, which most people who know about beer in San Diego know about Alesmith. That's a pretty big right, one. Right. Um, and so <laughs> Skip sold Alesmith um, kind of before the craft beer boom and uh, sort of went into the private sector. He's a financial guy, uh, but he continued to homebrew, um, he continued to entertain offers for you know, moving into another operation like this. And uh, we just started kicking around the idea, gosh, probably five, six years ago, just kind of meeting for beers with other friends, talking about it, Arturo's expertise in the restaurant business and um, uh, Skip's expertise in the brewery business. And so, um, You know, it's one of those things where we just, uh, you know, one thing led to another, a couple opportunities came up and uh, we kind of fast tracked it at one point and just found this location, which was a parking lot. And, um, you know, this opportunity came up. We got some uh, friends and family to serve as investors who believed in us. And um, we broke ground late 2017, about a year in construction and opened this past January. So uh, it's one of those kind of a unique combination, I think, where we have really great food, kind of the restaurant side guided by the Whiskey Ale team. Uh, chef Ryan Johnston's the critically acclaimed chef here. They, they known for Whiskey Ladle, uh, the restaurant in La Jolla, as well as Catania. Um, and so this is the first time really developing more mainstream food items in there. You see, we have a great menu that's constantly being tweaked and changed. Um, and then great beer, obviously, on the beer side with uh, Skip's recipes and our brew team, um, Tommy uh, Kramer and Mike Williams implement that on a daily basis. So if you love food, you know, come here, discover the beer. If you love beer, come here, discover the food. Location's excellent for very central in San Diego. A lot of people, it's very easy to get to and family friendly. You know, we have a big beer garden outside. We have indoor dining. We have casual dining. We have sports on. So it's a little bit of everything and it's, it's worked out well. Yeah, yeah, no, I've been impressed. The uh, I was here uh, a, a couple weeks ago, and I think it was a Tuesday or Wednesday night, and the place was booming. I was, it's for a, uh, and it's a big space. So for a big space in under a year old, it's it's impressive. Yeah, we're right about thirteen thousand square feet. Um, over half of that is an outdoor beer garden, um, and so you know you think San Diego, there'd be a lot of options for outdoor dining and in uh, drinking and. 
there really isn't. That was kind of when we first started this project. We really wanted to kind of make sure we spotlighted that. And so um, we get a lot of traffic during the day with the tech sector here. Um, people, again, who are, work very close by. And so lunch through happy hour, through early dinner, we get a lot of business. Um, anytime there's sports like tonight, Monday night football, it's pretty packed out there in the patio. Um, the weekends kind of care a little more with the families who come in because, um, again, there's kind of a whole side yard there where kids can play and hang out. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's uh, a little bit of everything. You know, it's the, we kind of have a little bit uh, different model in terms of where our demand is compared to some other kind of similar restaurants or breweries. But um, we're very stoked. We get a lot of people coming in through the doors. Yeah, no, for a, a new venture, that's got to be exciting when, you, when you're not, like, worrying about having the lights on next month. Yeah, you know? so, and that, I think that's one of the benefits yeah. of really kind of moving into the Wiscomel Hospitality Group is that they're known operators. Uh, they had an existing ecosystem and culture that this was their biggest project to date. This is their only project to take on outside investors. Obviously, the only project to have an in-house brewery, which kind of gives some more logistical challenges. Um, and the lights are kind of dimming on us. It's very romantic now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, again, they, they had uh, experts in terms of marketing, PR, hiring, management. And so it's such a, a great team. And this has been a challenge because, it's, um, you know, we have more staff here than their other two restaurants combined. So everyone's been growing and learning. Um, since we opened, they actually opened a, a food hall concept about a half mile west of here just two weeks ago. Um, so that's a place that'll spotlight our beer, but it's another concept where really is catered more to the workforce that is walking distance of that area. Right, right. Are you, are you guys the only microbrew or uh, craft brew place in this area? Yeah, so uh, there are a couple close by. If you go about a mile west, you, there's the Carl Strauss Sereno Valley location, which is one of, I believe it's their second ever. It's been there for mm -hmm. over 20 years. Um, a great setting. It's kind of set back on a little Japanese uh, koi pond. Um, but their food is kind of a little bit more kind of uh, maybe mainstream. Right, traditional. And it's been around for a while. Yeah. Um, and uh, I love Carl Strauss. Uh, Carl Strauss beer is some of my go-to, especially kind of anywhere uh, that I'm looking for beer kind of in grocery stores or they're just all over the place. Right. Um, and so that's probably the closest option. Green Flash is about a, a half mile east of us. They don't really have much of a food option. Right. It's more of a tasting room. And then if you go a little bit further, um, sort of east and south, you start hitting the uh, Miramar, Biramar area, where it's just uh, a brewery on top of brewery, including th places like Alesmith, McKellar, all the way to um, sort of the eastern edge there, where you have the Scripps Ranch, essentially. And so that's a big sort of sprawl of, of breweries and brewery tasting rooms and beer bars. Right, right. And I will uh, attest to how good the food is. We, uh, I tried the wings here. I tried the duck appetizer yes the duck bon me yes absolutely. and that was that was amazing and uh, one of the pizzas so so it was all uh, all excellent the uh, pizza's bomb uh we have a great white pizza um that has a uh, uh it's finished with truffle honey it's just got that nice sort of savory and sweetness on it um one one good thing we do is only on sundays we have frickin chicken which is chef johnson's special fried chicken uh, he does it two ways kind of original and, and korean style and that is delicious I almost always forget about it, but sometimes when I end up here on Sundays randomly, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's chicken, it's freaking chicken day. <laughs> it's just like such a treat, and they have great sides on that too. And so, um, yeah, the menu is great, and again, they make seasonal changes. There's lots of items that they play with, so that's part of the exciting thing is coming in. When I do come in, and be able to see what's new and what's different there. Right, right, excellent. Um, let's, let's back up just for a second and talk a little bit about how um, – somebody who's kind of an alcohol and drug researcher yeah. um, like myself um, gets into the brewing industry. Didn't you start as a uh, kind of a home brewer? Yeah, I, I kind of, you know, I, I had a, you know, I went, as I went through high school and, and college, I had a, an affinity for beer, as most young men do, uh, but wasn't really, uh, you know, the craft beer scene was, was pretty nascent, you know, in the late 90s early 2000s um, and so it really wasn't until i came out to um, san diego in 2006 is when i really kind of realized kind of really the the, the breadth of, of beers and breweries out there and i remember ale smith was one of the first breweries i went to where i remember having their ipa and being blown away and their grand crew and i got growlers of both of them and i took them home and i just 
had dreams about how great this beer was. It was just sort of a, a changing uh, sort of landscape for me. And so I really wanted to try immerse into it. So I ended up visiting breweries, started meeting people. Um, and then that opportunity came up about a year later to participate in the Beer Judge Certification Program, BJCP. Um, so this is a national organization that trains individuals to become proficient and expert in classic beer styles. Um, and I actually did the training with Peter Zine, who was the current and still is the owner of Ale Smith, um, and one of his head brewers, Bill Batten. It was actually the last class they taught. Um, this was in 2000, and, I want to say seven, 2008. So went through the process, went with a, a lot of great people that actually ended up going into the industry. And there was a way to kind of be, uh, become a part of that industry without having to work in that industry. I obviously had my own career kind of right, developing right. and unfolding here in San Diego on the academic side. And uh, it was a way to kind of be more than just a consumer, to kind of be an educated consumer, but also to judge and, and be a judge and evaluate beers um, at the uh, both homebrew level as well as a professional level. Um, and so um, I was doing that as I was getting my feet wet in homebrewing, as I had more space, kind of we upgraded living spaces. So I started in a small apartment in, in La Jolla where just it was a nightmare to get the equipment and, and brew. Um, but then as I got a bigger space, I was able to get a refrigerator to be able to um, ferment, control temperature, which is a big key, um, right. and, and got really into homebrewing for years and years. I don't homebrew as much now. I still try to stay active with the, the judging, but you know, kind of a lot of my energy kind of really devoted into this project to say, hey, this is a unique opportunity to really build on my expertise here, the connections I have through my judging and through homebrewing uh, to really contribute to this project. So I think it's kind of evolved over time where I have a brewery here that I'm a co-founder and co-owner of. It blows my mind, you know, right, it's, it's right. really trippy. And so um, it's been exciting. It's a, and I have a lot of people to, to thank for their assistance along the way, but it's right. great. Well, I think uh, for a lot of the guys listening, going from beer judge to a brewery owner is probably the dream trajectory. So, <laughs> so yeah, you're doing well. Uh, yeah, yeah. My my only suggestion is to to have a uh, you know make friends with a, a very successful uh, restaurateur CEO because yeah. um, uh, that was really the key for me was to kind of just right. be able to find a uh, a person who was open to that idea and um, you know Arturo and the Wisconsin team really. Um, this is kind of their baby too. I'm just happy to contribute to it. So right. it's definitely been a fun time. Let's talk a little bit about the beer. Yeah, um, let's do it. So um, why don't you kind of walk me through um, what you brew, how much you brew, how many how many taps you have going at any certain time with different you know different flavors and go from there. Yeah, we um, you know we basically have about 24 taps here in house. Um, we brew on average about twice a week, most weeks. Um, our brew house is a 15 barrel system. Um, most of those batches are single batches. Um, so this ends up being, you know, once you kind of uh, account for, you know, there's some lossage as you kind of go through that process, most batches are being 12 to 13 barrels. Um, we do do some double batching, which are larger 25 to 30 barrel um, batches. And that's really for some of our most popular styles, including our June Gloom, which is our hazy IPA. It's our number one bestseller by far. And so that is basically constantly being brewed. It's either, yeah, in the fermenter, uh, in the serving tank, about to be brewed, um, and again, a big double batch. So we go through a lot of that every week. Um, and if we, if there's a time where there's a lapse of us not having it for a couple of days, people get very upset. Right, and right. They revolt, even though there's lots of other options. Uh, we, we try not to anger our guests and make sure we have that always available. So for th those of you listening uh, who don't live in San Diego, June Gloom is our annual uh, kind of transition from spring to summer where it's cloudy every day yep uh sometimes it'll burn off if you live uh east of the freeway uh but eventually most, most days it stays cloudy all day so uh it's it's our um kind of analog to the gloomy winter days back east where someone's drinking a stout <laughs> exactly exactly yeah we, we'd go for the, the more hoppier version and the newer hazy ipa style uh, for the June gloom, but you know, it's just one of those catchy names. We weren't the first to think of it, obviously, because it is so catchy. Uh, it sounds a lot better than May Gray. It doesn't sound mm -hmm. good for a beer, so we stuck with, with June gloom. Um, and so, 
Uh, so yeah, that's kind of what we're, we're doing. So again, brewing about twice a week, typically. We have a whole wide range. You know, one of the things that we really wanted to make sure is that we're covering, that we have a lot of variety in terms of our, our styles because we have a lot of people coming here that are maybe more uh, newer to the beer scene. And so having really approachable beers that are more in the sessionable range, you know, kind of around 5% or less. Um, so we uh, always have one or two Pilsners or Lagers. Uh, we've been brewing some Kettle Sours, uh, which again is a little bit more approachable for people who may not like the bitterness of some of the more hoppy beers. Um, but San Diego's a hop town, so you know probably about a third of our beers most time is going to be some sort of hoppy beer, whether that's a Pale Ale, IPA, Double IPA, Hazy IPA. Um, right now what we have in front of us, um, we have a brand new Hazy Pale called Bucket List. Um, so we did a one beer like this before, it was a little bit different, called Giggling Monkeys. Um, so one thing we do here is we do occasional collaborations with guests. Um, you typically guests who, um, you know, we kind of make charitable uh, donations and gift packages and, and uh, Arturo really drives that. And so we've had, um, you know, packages go out where the, the winner gets to come and brew with us for a day basically help develop the recipe, come Very up with cool. a name. Um, so we did a bunch of these at the beginning. Uh, this is the first one we've done, in the, uh, it's been a few months, uh, but it was again, one of the uh, charity winners came out and brewed with uh, Skip and Mike and Tommy, um, and they wanted to do a pale ale, kind of a little bit more hazy. So um, this is nice, we just tapped this on Monday, so it's as fresh as they come. Um, again, it's gonna have a little bit less uh, sort of hop forwardness uh, as compared to like a hazy IPA. It's gonna have that juicy fruit uh, kind of uh, character. Be a little bit lower in ABV. And so this is something I just uh, actually just tasted it for the first time on Monday and was really um, uh, impressed by. It's coming in at 5.7%. Um, it's uh, really characterized by mosaic and cashmere hops, which are kind of two of the newer kind of in-demand hops. Uh, but yeah, this is a, a cool style and a cool opportunity to kind of reach out and do some collaborations with uh, our guests so yeah it's really nice really really drinkable um and you mentioned collaborations um in terms of kind of the brewing scene in san diego it seems like there's less competition and more collaboration or kind of a community around it than yeah. you might expect if you were kind of looking at any other industry where it'd be cutthroat yeah I, I think that's that's as long as I've been sort of privy to the industry and, and known people in it, that seems to really kind of go back decades, right? It's, it's kind of this, uh, you know, kind of this home brewer mentality where I think, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, there weren't uh, brewery supply stores. There weren't easy way to get equipment. And so people who are interested in it, kind of the, the sort of the initial sort of pioneers in this area really depend on each other for, um, bouncing ideas off of and uh, sharing ideas and sharing beers and getting feedback um, and so it's always been a very um, uh, friendly industry and I think that's still the case today I think there's a lot more breweries now than there were obviously um, but I, it's something that we enjoy doing and a lot of breweries enjoy doing have a chance to either have other brewers come here and share some of their skills and techniques with us and do a fun beer together or to, to go out to other breweries and so you know, it's just one of those things that is kind of bizarre. You don't see this in a lot of other consumer sectors um, in terms of this sort of an almost cross pollination or, or just sharing. Uh, but it is very much alive in the brew scene, both on a local level, but also like a national level. I just went to the Great American Beer Fest last month, and that's just obviously it's a party nonstop. Right, right. You, know, you really have to pace yourself. Um, but everyone's excited for everyone. We go to the, the awards ceremony on the last day. Uh, we just went crazy anytime someone from San Diego won a medal. It didn't matter if it was us, it was those people we knew and just being so happy for other people. And um, I think there's just so many good people, you know, it's just that they put, put, the, put themselves out there, able to kind of really connect with each other and, and share. People are very open with, you know, uh, their techniques and their, their experiences and willing to share. And, and that's one of the really cool things that's, I think, always been a part of, especially here locally. Right, right. Um, where would you put San Diego as a beer town in, in the national scene? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's up there. It's a controversial debate, you know. <laughs> you get these clickbaity articles usually every few months about which city is a beer town. Um, you know, there's lots of different indicators. But I would say we're definitely up there, you know, top five. You know, some people would give us number one. Some people give us, you know, a little bit less. But, you know, we're up there. right now, I'd say... Um, you know, Portland's kind of been a stalwart. They've always been right. kind of at the forefront of the beer scene. Uh, Denver's got a huge scene uh, in the sort of uh, mountain area there. 
East Coast has got a lot of different styles and, and breweries popping up all across. You know, North Carolina is big, especially Asheville. I've never been, but I know they have tons of breweries there. Um, New England, you know, think about one of the most popular breweries is the New England Treehouse because they were kind of the brought forward this New England hazy IPA, and they're just constantly demand is just through the roof. And so, um, you know, I would kind of, if I had to pick a couple, I would say San Diego, I would say Portland, Denver, Asheville, you know, throw San Francisco in there. Right. Um, right. But it's, it's tough. Depends on what you like, you know? Right. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, San Diego boy. So I'll give us the, nod, yes, but, exactly. Uh, a little biased here, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, so the, the, the other thing I was curious about kind of was, um, you know, I'm you know, 55 years old. I've been drinking beer like you since high school. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the things they do teach you in Catholic school, by the way, back then <laughs> was uh, how to drink. Um, but, you know, IPA wasn't really the, the big thing. You know, yeah. people would drink lagers or pilsners or and then it's kind of like. And I remember in college drinking uh, Sierra Nevada and a couple hoppy beers. Yeah. Uh, but now, man, that seems to be like the go to for connoisseurs. Can you talk a little bit about that and how we ended up there? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's been a growing style, you know, kind of just looking for evidence of that. The GABF, you kind of looking at seeing what categories professional brewers were entered in. The top two this year by huge margin was IPA and Hazy IPA. Hazy IPA actually just debuted there last year, so it's only the second year they've done it. Um, but there's hundreds and hundreds of entries in those two most competitive areas. So we know this is not just a little local or regional thing. This is national, like you're saying. And so it's been an evolution. And again, I think it's it's got origins in the West Coast. Um, you mentioned Sierra Nevada, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, which is kind of one of the beers and the breweries that you point to as kind of really kickstarted this focus, this change in the paradigm and sort of hop bitterness, right? And the, the, the Sierra Nevada pale ale they have is still classic it's so delicious you get a fresh batch of that it's just um so unique and so different and you know again here in the west coast um you know ipas just kind of blew up here you know right. 10 20 years ago and so stone was kind of one of the bigger players there that really pushed out the stone ipa but they also had arrogant bastard and some strong ales and even their pale ale was was kind of different at the time right right and so we kind of had a lot of pioneers um that were really pushing um, you know, kind of bitter beers. And I, I think it was really uh, West Coast centric for quite a while. Um, you know, when did it shift national? That's a tougher thing to pinpoint. Dogfish Head has been popular for a while. I think they're kind of one of the pioneers on the East Coast, but East Coast IPAs are a little bit more malt forward, right? And right. so at some point, I would say maybe 10 years ago, give or take, we kind of had this West Coast takeover where people were really ta uh, taken into sort of this West Coast style, which is very clean, crisp malt bill, almost like a blank canvas for the hops to really shine, the bitterness to really shine. And so we kind of went through different stages there where initially it was kind of like this hop bitterness IBU, kind of how far can you sort of push the bitterness. And then people got a little fatigued on that and switched into kind of more juicy hop styles. And so this whole time the hop industry is, there's a shortage in there, uh, you know, at some point where it's really hard to find a lot of the newer hops. And then people in that industry really kind of saw us as an opportunity to develop newer and different tasting flavor hops. And so this has led to a whole evolution and boom in the hop industry for these great hops we have today that are one year, two years, a few years old. You know, Mosaic wasn't really around much five years ago, and that's one of the most popular hops now. Right. Galaxy right. is a big one. And so, you know, I, I, you know, I think one of the things that kind of credit that sort of westward push, I think, is Sculpin. Um, I was just, that's just something from my own experience that we had it here. We were kind of spoiled, and it was like, oh, yeah, this is a great example of saying a West Coast uh, IPA. But we had a lot of beers like that. You know, Green Flash did a great West Coast IPA. It was called West Coast right. IPA. Um, again, Stone IPA, Stone Ruination, they did some big double IPAs too. Uh, but I think Sculpin was really the one that started really pushing that nationally. I remember going to the East Coast in like the late 2000s before, right as it was kind of peaking and went to beer bars there in, in like DC with my friends who love beer and I'd go there and it was all San Diego beer, including Sculpin and Sculpin was everywhere there. And I said, okay, this is a thing. Obviously, they sold a few years later for a billion dollars to Constellation. Right, right. So um, they were really kind of uh, moved the market and created the market nationally. And 
that's the style that dominates today. And then that's given way to the hazy IPAs, which are a little more niche, but again, that's our top seller right now. So you kind of have this balance right now between sort of these clean, crisp West Coast IPAs, which I'm a little bit more of a fan of, and the juicy, less bitter hazies, which are a little bit more um, approachable for people who are maybe newer or just don't like that hot bitterness. So they'll keep continuing. We're not going to see either one of these go away. We might see some newer offshoots. There are things like milkshake IPAs that are really dense and fruity. Um, Brute IPA was around a few years back. That's kind of come and gone. That's, you don't see that too often, but that was like a really clean, um, very light version of um, uh, IPA. If you remember like Stone Go sure, IPA. Sure. Um, I think Avery still does one on a sort of a, a larger level. Um, but it's it's everywhere. Yes, yeah, it's, it's still one of these things nationally, craft beer. It's a kind of IPA synonymous with, with craft beer at this point. And all the other styles are kind of catching up to it, I think. Right. It's interesting as you talk, you know, a lot of these breweries have their kind of signature beer. And, yeah. You know, you, you think of um, Belching Beavers, got the peanut butter stout. You yep. know, it's just different. Yeah. If, if you guys were kind of want to be known for a thing, what, what do you think, you, where do you think you'll land? And maybe it's too, maybe you're too new to know that yet. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough because, um, you know, we, we're, we're kind of, uh, philosophy side, kind of more kind of in that pizza port model where mm -hmm. it's just trying to do great beers. We're, we're always kind of trying new recipes. We don't want people to come in and have, see the same four, six, eight, ten core beers. Right. We want people to come in and see um, new beers, different styles every time. Um, you know, if, if there's one beer that we have that people know us by, it is the June Gloom. Um, it's our number one seller by far. Um, it's one that we try to get in people's hands, especially people who, again, might be newer to the beer scene. Um, but, you know, Skip and, and myself and, our, and Tommy and Mike, we love traditional styles. We love our Pilsner. We just did a Hellas a few months ago. That's great. We have a table beer in front of us here. This is called De La Mesa. It's really um, nice. So this is a, a clean, crisp, uh, Belgian-style table beer. It came in a little bit higher than we wanted to. Bel table beers are uh, kind of a niche uh, style that we don't really see too much in the, in the U.S. Um, there is one brewery here that did it really well, Benchmark Brewing. They unfortunately closed last year. Um, and actually, our, our assistant brewer, Mike, is, was from, Bel uh, from Benchmark. Uh, he worked with them for a while. And so this is a chance. It's a 4.6% beer. It's got some of that, um, uh, again, sort of Belgian beer kind of phenols and flavors. Um, but uh, very, very crushable. Um, again, someone who maybe not have as much experience, this is something that they could try and have. Might have some flavors there they can really enjoy. So where does the, the, the term table beer come from? Yeah, so this is, again, this is kind of specific to Belgium. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how much it extends into Europe, but it's it's just like like a house wine almost. Okay. Yeah, All right, it's so. just a simple um, Belgian beer, really easy uh, to brew, really easy to turn around. I, I think it has its basis in sort of um, uh, kind of having a, an easy beer to give like workers during the day. Right. Just something that's right. kind of on a lot of households where, you know, again, it's, it's, it's really more... Um, just very just like a common beer that is easy to make and, and, and easy to drink. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting too. You, you look at um, kind of the, the trajectory of the beer industry where we went from probably lo a lot of local little breweries that were serving workers, yeah. local bars, that sort of thing. Not that long ago, really. Yeah. In, in the, the scope of time, 100, 100 years yeah. or less. To this huge alcohol industry with a few big in your big players your InBev, your yeah. cores your uh, and now we're swinging back yeah um, yeah where it's, it's hyper local again right i mean yeah. you still have the big players there um but if you ever go there's there's uh you know information sites and beer statistics sites if you look at these sort of maps you can kind of each year by year how many breweries were in the u.s from you know 1900s, 1800s, on to present day. Obviously, you kind of see sort of very few early on, and then you kind of see a little bit of a rise, and you see prohibition where it all drops off, right. and then coming back in, and there's sort of this mini craft beer ex movement in the 80s, and that kind of falls down, and then you see this explosion right. in the last you know, 15, 20 years. And it's, it's the growth is definitely sort of, uh, at least here in San Diego and Southern California, has sort of tailed off a bit. There's There are new places opening, but they're typically um, more kind of brewery restaurant concepts. They're really combining food and beer. Um, it's really difficult, I think, for a lot of uh, new breweries to open if they just rely solely on the beer or on distribution because it is such a 
you know, it can be argued saturated marketplace. Um, and so um, it, it is interesting to see over time, but you know, that's what it is. That's what we are. We're hyper local here where, you know, we're not getting people who are driving, you know, half an hour, an hour to get here. Our, most of our customer base are, you know, work within five minutes of here right. and uh, 10 minutes of here. And, you know, that's where it is. Neighborhood uh, bars, neighborhood beer bars, neighborhood breweries, you know, it's definitely, you know, people do like to do a little beer tourism and venture around. Um, but, you know, it's hyper local now, a lot of these options. So if you, if people wanted to, to try your beer beyond coming in here, which I do recommend. Yeah. But, um, how, how else can, can, can folks find you? And, and well, it's a, it's a little tough. It, it's best to come here, come check it out. Um, we do have some draft accounts around town. Um, it's one of those things where we don't currently can or bottle any of our beers. Um, but we do have connections. We do have, um, you know, people out there in the industry that we love to work with that have great beer facilities, beer bars. And so uh, we'll send our beer to O'Brien's and, and uh, Curdy Mesa, um, Hamilton's down in uh, South Park, um, small bar down in uh, uh, University Heights. Um, so, you know, uh, we try to kind of get some get our beer out there to our friends who, you know, it's, it's kind of the top tier of, of beer bars around here. Um, other than that, if, if you're close to any of the Whisk and Ladle restaurants, so again, Catania and Whisk and Ladle are both in La Jolla Cove, they have our beers, the New Park Commons, which is just a you know, half mile away from here, they're going to have all our beers. Um, but you know, we'll see what the future holds, we may kind of expand out a little bit more, but you know, we definitely like to you know, get, get our beer out there and uh, get feedback from people. We, we have some fun accounts that, um, you know, there's, a, uh, there's a barbecue place called BT's, have you heard of BT's? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Brad at BT's has been one of our strongest supporters. And gosh, I think aren't they, they're in Santee, I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're nowhere near this. But just from day one, uh, I think Skip met him. Skip's gone there a few times. Um, he's just one of our accounts that's out there that we just send beer to. And, and they love it there. And we get great feedback from him. And so there's a sushi place in Carmel Valley that our COO is friends with. And so they love our beer. And so we have all these little interesting pockets. but. By far and away, especially if you want to try the range, uh, make a trip out here to Serena Mesa. We're not too far from anything. Try out some food, try out some beer, enjoy the beer garden, and um, yeah, we'd be excited to have you. Very cool. Uh, let's last thing. We'll talk yeah. a little bit about the uh, cask beer here because that is uh, that's really tasty. Yeah. So cask beer is uh, something we wanted to make sure we did on a regular basis, um, and so we don't have like a set schedule, but in general, we try to have a, a beer on cask at least every week or two. Um, this is our shady oak brown ale coming in at five and a half percent. Brown ales are one of my favorite styles. My claim to fame here in terms of the recipe side was when we opened up, we had a brown ale called Tory Porter. That was my homebrew recipe. This, that was my one creative contribution nice. to our beer lineup. <laughs> and people loved it. It ended up being a little bit more roasty than a brown. Uh, we haven't brewed it since, but this is sort of its spiritual successor. So I still feel like I had at least a, a small hand in this. Um, obviously, uh, Tommy and our brewers, um, you know, they really kind of took it over. Uh, but this is a, a, a great style. Uh, again, cask is something where uh, no, no carbonation and it's off the beer engine. Um, so when we put these on, they don't last very long. Um, it's kind of, you know, we'll push stuff out, uh, announce them out through Instagram typically. Um, but again, this is just a, a really nice example of a, a cask ale done right. I love the maltiness, the, the sort of that, that nutty kind of flavor, but again, you, you don't have any carbonation, it's naturally carbonated, and so it's, it's just a treat to try something a little bit different. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's nice for the season, too. It's kind of got that fallish taste to it. So yeah. Even really, though we are in San Diego, we do have a sli not, slightly colder season, right? Yeah, it was 91 today. Yeah. <laughs> but it's 94, yeah. but it's going to rain tomorrow. So <laughs> yeah. It's um, it's a little bro, but yeah, we, we again, we, we kind of have our eyes, you know, we didn't do a pumpkin beer, you know, we try not to get too wrapped up in the trends that people sure. typically aren't excited about, um, but we do want to have uh, a kind of darker beer option, especially as we get into slightly chillier time here. And so we have um, our end of the line barley wine, we have our, uh, this is our, our Shady, Oak, Shady Oak Brown, Cole's Porter. Right. Um, so again, we'll just try and make sure that we kind of have a range at all time and that, you know, no matter what your preference is, we have something for you here. Right. I know I said it was going to be the last thing 
but you guys do kombucha too, kombucha too, don't you? Uh, we serve kombucha. We don't make it ourselves. Okay. All right. Yeah, um, All right. but that's you know again we do we do mocktails, we do kombucha, we have cider. Um, so those aren't ours. Um, usually our kombucha is through June Shine, um, cider is through Bivouac. Um, so friends of ours in the industry. Um, we, we don't do that ourselves because that takes a slightly different sure. process. Um, but that's something that, again, if, if people come in um, and they just don't like beer or aren't really uh, versed in that, um, and uh, you know, kombucha is pretty popular now, so to have that option I think is helpful for people to feel like they can have something they enjoy without feeling pressure to try something else. Yeah, you also have a very nice wine list, so yeah. uh, which I was uh, looking at before we started. So yeah, a nice nice variety across the board. Yeah, and I have to, uh, you know, the, the wine program is again driven by uh, uh, Arturo and a lot of our um, uh, staff on that side. So I have, I have no say on that myself, but I, I trust him and I trust you. I'm glad you enjoyed the wine you selected. Um, but yeah, again, just, just something for everyone. So. Um, you know, we, we're gonna, we're excited heading the holidays here. Um, it's it's getting busier and busier. You know, people are kind of timing your holiday parties, and so you know, one thing about the space is that we do have room for private events. Right now, we're sitting in the private upstairs dining, uh, but a lot of times people rent out parts of the beer garden downstairs, and so we're kind of in that stage where just hearing through the grapevine through the events team about there are certain days where it's like we are completely full already. And so that's exciting. Again, just to get people in here the holidays, share with them what we're doing on the, both the, the beer and the food side. So looking forward to see how things go here. Right, right. Uh, social media or anything like that you, yeah. you give folks yeah. who are interested in checking it out in more depth? Yeah, social media. So our main social media um, is Instagram. So it's just Gravity Heights. Um, and we're pretty active there. We post events when we have them, new beer releases when we have them. We do have a Facebook page. It's a little bit less updated, um, but sometimes we'll be able to put events up on there. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, I typically post a lot of um, Gravity Heights content on my personal Instagram account, which is SD Beer Insider. Um, I have both an Instagram and a Twitter account. You know, I'm again a little biased, and I kind of I try to put some other beer reviews too, and other beer centric things uh, there. But um, definitely leans a little bit towards how great Gravity Heights is, of course. <laughs> Well, very good. It is great. And I'm going to finish these samplers here. Nice. Uh, but we'll we'll wrap this up for the listeners. And hey, Ryan, thanks a lot, man. I, I enjoyed having you on. And we'll definitely uh, swing back in a year or so and see where you guys are uh, at. That'd be awesome. Thanks so much, Sean. I appreciate it. All right. Very All right. good. Thanks. As long as there is any alcohol in the bloodstream, some of it reaches the brain. But its main effects follow a general pattern. At first, the greatest...